For tonight we have met to observe the Lord's Supper once again. I was trying to determine in the almost 37 years I've been here, I was wondering how many Lord's Suppers have I been a part of here. And uh, come up at least 140 Lord's Suppers that I've uh, participated in here. The Howards probably have 200 because they've been here from the very beginning for 50-something years. And uh, yeah, we have some who have been here for years that have never attended a single one, which kind of grieves me. So I'm glad you're here. You know, if you were to attend the services of other churches when they observe the Lord's Supper, you might be surprised at the variety of practices and beliefs even names associated with this service. In some places, it's a very informal service. In others, it's an elaborate service with a priest and uh, his attendants and colorful vestments. Uh, with some, they use a single loaf of bread and you tear off a piece and pass it around. I think that's probably how Jesus' apostles did it. They just had one bread, and they would tear off a piece and pass it around. Of course, there was only 12 or 13 of them, which is a bit easier than trying to do that here. And they'd probably just use one cup, take a sip and pass it on. Now, I don't churches that do that. You want to make sure you don't get behind the guy that chews tobacco <laughs> if you're going to share a cup. Does anybody here chew tobacco? Angela's only one. But uh, we use the small wafers and the individual cups. In the Catholic Church, the priest alone drinks the wine, and the people just get the wafer. You've probably seen that where they go by, and they stick their tongue out, they put the wafer. You might try that with the deacons tonight. You stick your tongue. <laughs> that wouldn't work, would it, because they put the wafer under the cup. So don't do that. Don't stick your tongue out at the deacons because they, they can't help you. But I, I'm just pointing out there's different ways people do it. Uh, some had the people come forward to receive the elements and some stay in their seats and uh, they're taken to them. We've done it both ways here. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure we did it right once. But uh, some teach the elements, the cup and the bread, are actually the physical bread and blood of the Lord. That's, that's what the Catholics teach in their Mass, that their priests can change the bread into the very flesh of Christ and the cup into the very blood of Christ. By the way, they can't, but that's what they say. We believe the elements are symbolic. Uh, Jesus said, this is my flesh, right? But he said it symbolically. Just like he said, I am the door. He's not a literal door, is he? Symbolically, he's the door to heaven and to God. So we understand it to be symbolic. The bread symbolizes the broken body of Christ, and the cup represents his shed blood. You find different names uh, involved here. The Catholics call it mass. It's the words of dismissal. Or Missa is where the Mass word comes from. These are the words used by the priest. Some call it a sacrament, uncorrectly. It's not a sacrament. You know what a sacrament is? That's something needed to save you. In the Catholic Church, they have seven sacraments that are needed for you to go to heaven and skip purgatory. Most of them can't do that, so they've got to spend a little time in purgatory, which is not in the Bible either. But... Uh, you have that. It's not a sacrament. It doesn't help save you. It's called the Eucharist. What's the Eucharist mean? Anybody know? It means Thanksgiving, which is good. It's a time of Thanksgiving. And it's also called communion. Some churches have the Lord's Supper every Sunday, every Sunday morning. I believe the Church of Christ practiced that. Every Sunday morning they observe the Lord's Supper. By the way, that's the Lord's breakfast if you do it in the morning. Right? We do it right. Lord's Supper has got to be in the evening. 
We're correct about everything. You ever notice that? And we don't do it every Sunday. We do it every three or four months. The Bible doesn't say how often to do it. It just says as often as you do it, remember me. So basically the Lord leaves it up to each church how often they want to observe. If the church wants to do it every Sunday, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not unscriptural to have it every Sunday. Really, we only do it every three or four months because doing it every Sunday, it kind of becomes a routine. And people kind of go through it just uh, without a lot of thought. We don't want that to happen. So when we do it, we want to emphasize this. The whole service is emphasizing the Lord's Supper and helping us to prepare ourselves to celebrate this uh, supper. It is a church ordinance. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, first let me point out, it says in verse 1 or verse 2, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. There's two church ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Both of these are pictorial. And he says you're keeping them as you receive them. In other words, there's a right way and a wrong way to do these things. And we need to be careful that we do it correctly so that God can bless our time together. We're going to look at supper tonight in four ways as we partake it. I want you to think about these as we participate in the Lord's Supper tonight. If you want to stand with me, I'll let you sit down this morning. I'm going to make you stand tonight. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11 and start reading with verse 17. Hebrews 11, 17. Let's go. Do what? I think I did I say Hebrews? Don't go to Hebrews. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Let's start with 23. Don't mess me up anymore now. 11, 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. At the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. Talking about the church in Corinth. And many sleep. Many have died. For if you would judge yourselves, we would not be judged. But when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Amen. You may be seated. Four viewpoints I want you to see tonight concerning the Lord's Supper. First of all, I want you to see that here is a backward look of commemoration. Tonight we're going to look back 2,000 years ago when Christ was crucified on our behalf. It ought to move us first to dedication. We ought to be dedicated to our Lord. This do in remembrance of me. It's the supper of commemoration. Now, or to remember something here. Or to remember the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. We're not given anything to remember his teachings or to remember his miracles or his examples. 
We're not even given anything to remember his birth. Christmas is not found in the Bible. That, that didn't come out of the Bible. The only thing that we're told to remember and commemorate is the death of Jesus Christ. Remember his suffering on the cross and his death on our behalf. We sing about that blood redemption, don't we? Now, I know some people are repulsed by the doctrine of blood atonement. They mock it. They say it's slaughterhouse religion. Some have taken all hymns about the blood out of their hymn books. Now, I think if they make it to heaven, they're going to be surprised to find out they're singing about the blood in heaven. Did you know that? According to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, which is describing worship in heaven, says they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. They're singing this. This is a new song. Well, it's not new to us. We're singing about the blood all the time. So if you're repulsed by that, you've got to get over it. Because in heaven we're going to sing about the blood of Christ. God does not want us to forget or ignore the precious blood Jesus suffered and shed on our behalf. We might even sing some of the songs we sing. We might sing some of these in heaven. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is power, power, power in the blood. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we don't sing some of those songs in heaven. We'll sing about the blood. It ought to move us to dedication. And second, it ought to move us to devotion. Devotion to Christ and what he did on our behalf. You know, we pause on Memorial Day to remember those who died on battlefields. And we honor their memory as we should. That's good. How much more should we remember the one who died on a cross that we might have freedom from bondage to sin? How much more should he be remembered? If the supreme sacrifice of Christ does not move you, then something's wrong. Amen. It, this ought to compel us to remember and honor what Christ did. It's a backward look to Calvary. And it should stir up some gratitude on our behalf. It ought to stir up some heartfelt praise, loving worship of the Lamb of God. I think we just get a good look at what Jesus went through for us. We could not be indifferent about this, as some seem to be. We, we could not be unthankful or unfaithful concerning this. Our devotion to Christ ought to be great. And number three, it ought to move us to deliberation. Have we heard the story of the cross so much that we're no longer touched by it? Jeremiah wrote Lamentations. In Lamentations chapter 1, verse 12, he speaks of the great sorrow that he felt over the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple in his day. He said, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by, Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Can you imagine that coming from the cross? Can you imagine Jesus saying this? On the cross, is it nothing to you? Ye that pass by, have you seen sorrow like unto my sorrow? Wherewith the Lord hath afflicted, the Lord afflicted Christ on the cross. Read, read Isaiah 53. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the wrath of God was placed upon him. Those could be the dying words of Jesus. Is it nothing to us? What he suffered? Nothing enough to even want to bother to come back tonight to participate in this Lord's Supper? Is it nothing? My, I've told you a story before about the preacher who uh, was preaching on the crucifixion of Christ and 
And he was moved by the text. And, but he noticed that none of the congregation seemed to be moved at all by the story of Christ and his suffering. So he told a story about a hunter who was out hunting with his dog. And his dog kept scaring away the game. And it made the hunter furious. And after he had done it several times, he took out his big hunting knife, he chopped off the paws of that dog and threw it in the lake to drown. And the people were visibly moved by that story. Some were even weeping as he told that story. He said, folks, I just told you what Christ went through and there was no emotion at all. I tell you about a dog and you all get moved and start weeping. Is there something wrong here? Is there something wrong? Have we heard the gospel so much that it no longer moves us? That's sad, isn't it? I think many become gospel hardened. They've heard it so many times. They're no longer moved by it. We should pray to God that that doesn't happen to us. Amen. There's a backward look of commemorations. Then secondly, there's an inward look of examination. Here's a time for some personal checkups. Check up on our spiritual condition before we observe this supper tonight. Let's don't do this carelessly. Let's don't do this flippantly or disrespectfully. For it's awful to make light of holy things such as the blood and sacrifice of our Lord. Hey, this is a vital object lesson. The Lord's Supper. Picturing with the elements, the broken body, the shed blood of our Savior. It's an object lesson. And it's vital for us to do this and check up on our spiritual condition. Is there anything in our lives that needs to be dealt with? You know, if you want to avoid the judgment of God, the best thing to do is do some self-judgment. Some self-evaluation, some self-discipline. You see what happened in Corinth? Because of the way they treated the Lord's Supper, God was angry. He said, for this cause, many of you are weak and sickly. What cause? The way they were treating the Lord's Supper. Because the way you're treating the Lord's Supper, God has judged some of you and you're sick and weak because of it. Some of you have died. Some of the members of that church died premature deaths as a judgment from God because of the way they were treating the Lord's Supper. That's pretty serious, isn't it? We may not take this serious, but God does. Amen? God takes this very serious. We have members today that don't think what we're doing is important, but God does. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Don't ignore it. Don't neglect it. Do this. And remember what Christ did for you. It's a time of personal confessions. To avoid God's chastisement, we need to learn how to judge ourselves. We need to learn how to examine ourselves. And when we see sin in our lives, we need to confess those sins. We need to forsake those sins, those habits, those attitudes. And if we'll do it, God won't have to deal with it. Amen? It's a dangerous thing to wait and let God deal with it. It's dangerous to go on with unconfessed, unforsaken sin in your life. He talks about Taking this supper unworthily. I've had people say, well, I don't take the Lord's Supper because I'm not worthy. I just feel unworthy to observe the Lord's Supper. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the manner in which you take it. You can take it in an unworthy manner. That's what the Corinthians were doing. It was unworthy the way that they were observing the Lord's Supper. And so God judged them for that. Now some say, well... Uh, I just won't take it then. No, that'd be, that'd be another sin, not to take it. 
I mean, you're committing a sin by neglecting this and saying it means nothing to me. I'll just not take it. That's the wrong thing. That's the wrong attitude. That's as bad as taking it unworthily. Jesus said, do this. Do this. If you don't, you're disobeying the Lord's commandment. Examine yourself and then eat. He doesn't say examine yourselves and then don't eat, does he? No, examine yourself, take care of what needs to be taken care of, and then partake of the supper. Right? Don't let some besetting sin rob you of God's blessings. You know what a besetting sin is? That's a pet sin that we want to excuse. A pet sin that we want to justify in our life. Instead of dealing with it, we do that. Those are sins we've got to deal with and put away so God can bless us. So there's an inward look of examination. Then thirdly, there's an outward look of proclamation. He says, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That word show means to actually to proclaim. We're proclaiming something here tonight. We're proclaiming in the death of Jesus Christ that there's salvation. Here's a visual aid, like baptism. Baptism pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ when it's done properly. And the Lord's Supper pictures the sacrifice of Christ. And we're to keep these ordinances as they have been given to us. Water baptism should by, by immersion, not sprinkling, of a believer, not an infant, by proper authority of a New Testament church. That's the proper ordinance that was given to us of, of baptism. And the Lord's Supper, it should have a proper motive, a proper memorial, a proper message. And if we change anything, we destroy the picture that God has given us in these ordinances. Lord's Supper doesn't save you, but you can get saved because of it. Remember Robert Parrott's testimony? Those of you that go back that far. Remember Robert Parrott said he was saved at Lord's Supper. His father was his pastor, and as a young man, one night the church was taking the Lord's Supper. He wasn't a member, so he didn't partake, but... He said, uh, listening to what was said about it and how they observed it, he said, for some reason, that just really clearly taught me what salvation's all about. He said, more so than anything else, that really spoke to my heart. He said, I got saved that night. Amen. People can get saved by the way we observe the Lord's Supper when we do it correctly. Right? Then number four, there's an upward look of expectation. Tonight we're going to have an upward look of expectation. Till he comes, it says. We're going to observe the Lord's Supper till he comes. So here is a longing for the coming of Jesus Christ. He told his disciples in Matthew 26, 29, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So tonight we're looking forward, upward, to one. This may be the last time we observe the Lord's Supper as a church. One of these times is going to be the last time. Because Danny Wood says the Lord's coming in September. So we won't have another one. Till after that. So this could, Daniels could be the last time we do this as a church. And I hope you're right. <laughs> Amen. I hope Rosh Hashanah is going to be the time this year. Could be. But one of these times, it's going to be the last time we do this as Forest Street Baptist Church. Till we get to heaven and we're going to be at the big table. And the Lord's going to participate with us at the table of God. Boy, aren't you looking forward to that? I am. What a wonderful day that's going to be. So we're professing tonight our faith in Christ. 
and our, our belief he's coming back, he's coming back very soon. See, there's a link between the two comings here. The supper looks at the two comings of Christ. We look backward to his first coming. We look forward to his next coming. So there's a link here with both the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't think Christ is coming back, you shouldn't take the Lord's Supper. You'd be a hypocrite. Right? Because we're testifying not till he comes. He's coming back. And I'm looking forward to his coming. So this picture is our salvation. What Christ did for us at Calvary, what he's doing for us during this church age, and what he's going to do when he comes back. To establish his kingdom here on earth. So tonight, past, present, future. is going to be all involved in what we're doing tonight. Hey, this is the gift that keeps on giving. A perfect gift of salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we partake the Lord's Supper tonight, let's do those, three, those four things. Okay, you remember them? Look backward. A backward look of commemoration, an inward look of examination, don't forget to do that, an outward look of proclamation, and an upward look of expectation. When the deacons serve, there's going to be some time before everybody is served, so you're going to have time to meditate. Now I want you to meditate on what we've talked about tonight. And especially say, Lord, if there's anything, if there's any sin in my life, that I need to confess, show me. And get ready, he's going to show you. Some sinful habits, some sinful attitudes, he can very well show you. And when he does, confess them. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Help me to forsake this in my life before I take this Lord's Supper.